Well, hey, community of faith, how are you doing on this crazy weekend? You know, I miss you being here personally, but I so appreciate you inviting us into your home for this live stream. I want you to know that we're praying for you. I know that it's, it's kind of a strange time, but just like Wes said, get comfortable. Uh, in fact, you look really comfortable right now. I told my friend Mike at the gym yesterday, I said I was gonna call him out, so Mike, put your shirt on, right? I'm so glad to get to be here with you. I wanted to talk to you as we continue in our series on these miracles uh, of Jesus, those face-to-face -face miracles. We're gonna talk about one today that isn't usually even listed in the list of miracles. It's gonna be one that I think might be really appropriate for this particular weekend and, and, and the things that we're feeling. I was reading this week about Harry. He's a new retiree greeter at Walmart. And Harry is amazing. All of the uh, people love him at Walmart and he's just so friendly, outgoing. And he's just, just a really great guy and he really uh, puts the zip into what Walmart's trying to do you know, with those retiree greeters. And the only thing is Harry's always late. He's always about five, 10, sometimes even 15 minutes late. And, and so his, his young boss called him in the other day and said, Harry, what's the deal? I, I'm trying to figure out what to do with you. Everyone loves you. Everyone thinks that you're like one of the, the best greeters we have. But this, you coming in late really starts to, to kind of wear on, it's wearing on me a little bit. And he said, it's kind of weird to me that you're late because you retired from the armed forces, right? What? What did they say when you came in five, 10 minutes late? And Harry looked at him and said, they usually said, good morning, General. Can I get your coffee for you? Here's the thing. Sometimes there's an unexpected outcome when we're talking to someone or we come into a circumstance. That's what happens in this miracle. We're gonna see a miracle that happened to a guy by the name of Nathaniel. In John chapter one, his name is Nathaniel. We see him in other gospels, they call him Bartholomew. So what is his name, Nathaniel or Bartholomew? It's both, that's his first and last names. Nathaniel Bartholomew. Nathaniel, the son of Tolme, Bar Tolme. So Bartholomew. And we're gonna see this interaction between Nathaniel and Jesus. And I just think that, you know, if we're not careful, like Nathaniel, we can almost miss a miracle because it happens in a way that we're not expecting. It happens in a way that we're not really ready for. And that's what we're gonna see in this thing with, with Nathaniel. I think this miracle is not included in the list of miracles a lot of times because it's not one of those physical miracles like healing uh, of a, uh, a hand that's withered or, or, or someone that's crippled being able to walk or, or even the physical needs like Jesus speaking and giving food to all the multitude. What we see here is something just really subtle. But when we really dig into it, I think it's life-changing because this miracle shows us who God is. You know, Jesus came to earth. He came to earth to say, I'm going to die for you. I'm going to pay the price for you. But he also said, I came to show you what God's heart is like. I came to show you what God is like. If you've seen me, you've seen God. And Jesus shows us some things about God in this passage that, that are really mind blowing. How personal he is. How he sees us. How He's not like what we expect. In fact, God has his own agenda. It's not your agenda or my agenda. It's his agenda, and he's about his agenda. So we're gonna see all of these things that God's not put off by our doubts, even by our cynicism, that none of those things put him off. The miracle, the miracle that we're gonna see is experiencing God as he is meeting us where we are. And I think for those of us sitting right there at home on this crazy coronavirus weekend, I think this is a good time to meet God and for him to meet us. Nathaniel, let's read it. 
Here we go. It's in the John chapter one. We'll look at verses 43 through 51 and then break them down quickly. The next day, Jesus proposed, purposed to go into Galilee and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida of the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote the Messiah. He's talking about Jesus of Nazareth is his name, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and he said, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You, you are the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe you will see greater things than these? And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Jesus wasn't who Nathanael expected him to be. God's agenda wasn't what Nathanael thought it should be. We're gonna look at that, let's look. I want you to see first, a miracle starts not with our intellect, but with answering an invitation. I think it's important to understand that. It says, Philip found Nathanael and said, we found the Messiah. He's Jesus of Nazareth. And Philip says, and Nathanael says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Have you ever tried to argue someone into Christianity? See, I have these amazing rational arguments for the scripture, the Bible being true and for Jesus being who he said he was, but I found that any time that I argue someone into Christianity, someone else can easily argue them right back out of Christianity. Why? Because we're not really rational creatures. I know, I know you like to think of yourself as rational, but why did you buy 200 rolls of toilet paper yesterday? You know, to fight the coronavirus. I mean, what are we going to do? Throw toilet paper at it? I haven't figured that out yet, but we are not rational. It makes us feel better to be able to do something, right? I think meeting Jesus works a whole lot better. William Barclay tells a story about how Thomas Huxley, the, the famous agnostic toward the end of his life in the late 1800s, the brilliant scientist and, and well-known agnostic was attending a party at a country mansion. Now, really rich people in that day did parties different than us. Uh, the guests stayed several days. Maybe they still do. I don't know how they do it. You know, the really rich. But anyway, they were staying for several days. Sunday came around and most of the guests prepared to go to church. And very naturally, Huxley did not get ready. Everybody, you know, it was kind of like you're supposed to go to church back in this era in the late 1800s. But instead, Huxley approached a man known to have a simple and vibrant Christian faith. And Huxley said to him, suppose you don't go to church today. Suppose you stay at home and you tell me quite simply what your Christian faith means to you and, and why you're a Christian. And the, the man began to stammer a little bit. He said, but, but you could demolish my arguments in an instant. I'm not clever enough to argue with you. Huxley said gently, I don't want to argue with you. I just want you to tell me simply what this Christ means to you. So the man stayed at home and told Huxley most simply of his faith. And when he had finished, there were tears in the great agnostic's eyes. He said, I would give my right hand if only I could believe what you just said. You see, it wasn't clever arguments that touched Huxley's heart. It was simple Come and see, come and find what I've found. It was the story of the man's faith. The best argument for people is to just say, come and see. We have the opportunity at Community of Faith to do that all the time. We've designed the services, maybe even these next couple of weeks, this week and next week, these online services, you could just 
when you talk to a, a, a coworker at, on the phone, probably, you know, or at least from six feet away, you can say, hey, you should join us at church. And they'll say, well, you know, no online in your house and tell them it's at six o'clock on Saturday night, 9.30, 11.30 on Sunday. It's your chance to say, come and see. And they can come and see right in the privacy of their own home. But I want you to see a second thing. A miracle is not thwarted by doubt or our genuine questions. It's only thwarted by pride. So let's take a look. Nathaniel said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? We don't maybe know what, uh, what this is about. It's kind of like, he's saying it's Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah and Nathaniel's kind of sneering a little bit. Nazareth? See, everybody from Jerusalem looked down on the people from Galilee. They looked down, especially the people from Nazareth. It's kind of like today when you think of like the coastal elites, you know, versus flyover country and, and, and how we, we've kind of seen that playing out over these last few years. You mean he's from Nazareth? Why, why not Jerusalem, you know? Why not New York City? Why not Los Angeles or, or whatever? But we like to label people a lot of times. Reverend Patrick Payne tells this story on himself. He said he's the pastor of a large Baptist church up in Columbus, Ohio, and he asked his audience one Sunday, he said, how many of you here are Baptists? And he said, almost everybody raised their hand. And he said, how many of you are not Baptists? A single hand in the back of the church nervously went up and he just called out for the poet. He said, may I ask you, uh, what religious group, if any, do you belong to? And she called out, I'm a Methodist. Payne continued, and what makes you a Methodist? And she said, well, my parents were Methodists. My granddaddy was a Methodist preacher. My cousins and uncles are all Methodists. So I'm a Methodist. So Payne kind of felt a challenge, you know, and he challenged her. He says, ma'am, if your parents and grandfather and cousins and uncles were all morons, what would that make you? And she looked confused for a second. Then she said, a Baptist? She replied, I think that we have this tendency sometimes to like label and divide and do all this stuff. And it's always been the case that we want to look down on other people, right? We have this, this tendency to say, oh, you know, they don't come from the best family or those other people, you know, on the other side of the tracks or whatever it is. Jesus never did that. He didn't do that. And a lot of people look down on Christianity in the same way. And, and, and they kind of have this kind of sneer or rolling of the eyes. I was reading a book on marriage not long ago. And it said, when you roll your eyes, it's one of the indications that your marriage is almost at the very end. Because a relationship can survive a lot of things, but not contempt. You know, Christianity, it's from Nazareth. And it's still from Nazareth. It's not purporting to be some high and, and lofty thing that, that it's only for the elites so that people can go around and say, I'm a Christian and I'm better. You know, it's for all of us. I talked to people a lot of times. They said, oh yeah, Christianity, I grew up in it, but I've kind of evolved beyond it, you know? Pride is the thing that's gonna keep us. When we are full of pride, it stops all argument, all search, all finding. So we've got to always be humble and open and listening. You know, I think it's so important that, that we've got to say, I'm open, I'm looking, I'm searching, I want to know. And what we really find out is that Nathaniel, he said that, but we're going to find out that he really was searching. He still, when Philip said, come and see, he went, right? Because like so many of us, there was this deep longing in him that there might be something more. So Philip, he didn't try to argue. He didn't you know, try to say, well, um, let me see if I can answer your question about Nazareth. He, he didn't know the answers. So he just said, hey, come and see. I've already met this guy. I spent yesterday with him and I want you just to come and see. Let me ask you, have you read the words of Jesus? Have you investigated the claims of Jesus? How do you know if you've really come and seen. Here's what I, I, I think that if you've really come and seen, 
if you've really explored, if you've been really serious about it, what you're going to find is that you don't have to believe that Jesus was the Christ or that the gospels are accurate, but you're going to be pushed to the extreme of belief, whichever way you choose. And you're going to find that there's not a lot of middle ground. Let me just talk about that for a second. Have you read the gospels? They purport to be eyewitness accounts. Reynolds Price, a well-known scholar and literary professor at Duke University, he says, uh, modern fiction, modern narrative fiction uses details. At four o'clock, the character goes into the coffee shop and gets a, a latte. Well, ancient fiction never used details. Oedipus, you know, when he went to see the oracle at Delphi, it didn't say, and, and at four o'clock she came out and offered him a, a caramel macchiato with two shots. You know, it didn't have all of this little detail stuff. It's just always like big picture. You don't even really know when everything is happening. The details of the gospel, the, the technical language of the gospels, those first four books in the New Testament that tell of Jesus' life, they're saying this is an eyewitness account. This isn't a legend or just something that I heard. Uh, you know, this is, this is an eyewitness account. How can you come and see? They're inviting you in. I was there. The way you can hang out with Jesus is exactly the way I hung out with Jesus, they're saying. Here, here's what happened. Here's exactly what he said. Here's exactly what he did. I was there. Read my account. I was there. Come and see. Examine the evidence exactly like we did. Read the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Tim Keller, pastor in New York City. He says, how do you know if you've really come and seen? Well, you've been pushed to the extremes of credulity with either position you come up with. He said, if you have really looked at the evidence and come to a conclusion, that conclusion will be extremely hard to believe, whatever it ends up being. Why? Well, C.S. Lewis says it like this. Of this text, talking about the gospel, there are only two possible views. Either this is reportage, reporting on what they're seeing, or else some unknown writer in the second century without known predecessors or successors suddenly anticipated the whole technique of modern novelistic, realistic narrative fiction. If the gospel events didn't really happen, the gospel writers anticipated fiction not seen until the modern age. The reader who doesn't see this has simply not learned to read, says C.S. Lewis. So there, there's only two conclusions. Either a group of first century Jews who never believed that a man could be God, that was against their religion. They, they would never believe that. They came up with this elaborate system of lies, wrote it up, shared it with the world, and, and then went out and died for it to, to make the world believe it. And they lived the lies with such an attractive power that the whole Roman world was swept up and transformed by those lies. Not only that, these unschooled men invented modern narrative fiction thousands of years before it came on the scene. Either that, which is a little hard to believe, or the gospels are what they claim to be, eyewitness accounts to the life of Jesus. You see, there's no conclusion in the middle that you can come to. Maybe you're going like, well, Mark, what I believe is that Jesus was a good man, but a, a lot of the story in the Bible is just legend. That's intellectually lazy. That's not really one of the options. You haven't grappled with the facts. You haven't really come and seen. You don't have to believe in Jesus or in the Bible to have intellectual integrity, but you can't have that position in the middle. It's just not available, says Tim Keller. You know, today we have this kind of eclectic spirituality. It's kind of in, you know, it's like, I think God is like, but why does it matter what we think God is like? Doesn't it matter what he's really like? Well, I, I talk to people all the time and that, that's one of the ways they start things off. And, and, and I keep thinking of the words of Jesus when he says at the end of the age and we stand before him and he's going to say, I never knew you. I don't know you. And, and some of us are going to say, well, well, I was very spiritual. 
I, I did good works for you. I worshiped you. And he's going to say, no, you worshiped a God of your own making, not me. I never knew you. Traditional religion is just as bad in a total opposite kind of way. It's like, don't question. Don't have any any questions about anything. You just got to believe. If you don't believe, you're, you're wrong, you're bad. But God always invites us to question, to explore. He says, you're going to find me when you search for me with all your heart. But no games, no hypocrisy, no lazy thinking. That's why I want you to see the third thing about this miracle. A miracle is easy to miss in the moment. Nathaniel said to Jesus, how do you know me? See, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and he said, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit. That word for deceit there in our English, it literally means who doesn't wear a mask, who doesn't play games, who's not a hypocrite. And that makes Nathaniel go, yeah, that's me. I, I don't want to play any games. It kind of gives a different spin on even him saying, Nazareth, what's it? He wasn't maybe showing prejudice. What he was showing was like, that doesn't fit the scriptures. It says Bethlehem. It, it, it says that the, the Messiah and Jesus was from Bethlehem. He just didn't know it, right? And had moved to Nazareth later. But he says, how do you know me? And Jesus answered and said, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathaniel answers him back, Rabbi, you are the son of God. <clears throat> you are the king of Israel. And you look at that and you go like that. I don't, I didn't quite get that. Okay, so here's the cynic. And he says, I saw you under the fig tree, like walking around. Oh, there he is over there under the fig tree. That's not what happened. Let's look at what just happened. See, houses were small in this day. Usually just kind of a one room affair. And many times they would even have the cooking fire uh, right in, in the main room and the whole house would get smoky and, and stuffy. Well, what they would do is they would plant in the backyard and the front yard in these houses, a lot of times they would plant fig trees. Why? Because it was kind of like an extra room. It was more breezy outside. It was cooler outside. There's no central AC or anything, you know. And, and, and so... The fig trees, they would not grow very high, only about 15 feet high, but their branches would spread out as much as 25 to 30 feet. So you can just imagine, it's like 15 feet high, 30 feet around, and it gives this great shade, and it's kind of like an extra, uh, an extra room. In many of the poorer homes, it, it was a lot better than staying inside with the smoke and the heat and the other 12 people you know, in your house. But the fig tree had become a place for the Jewish people where they would go in the morning and spend time with God. That was their tradition. And they would go and they would sit outside and they would talk to God. And I think that this is what is happening here. That Nathaniel was out under the fig tree. Maybe it was just that very morning. Maybe it was over the last few days and weeks. And I think what's happening is that he's questioning God. Like, God, I don't understand. And see, no one could see him. He's probably in his backyard. Nobody sees him. Nobody's gonna walk by and say, oh, there's Nathaniel under the fig tree. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, when you were questioning, it, where's your Messiah? I mean, he's thinking, the Roman government, they've, they've, they're crushing us. I don't understand what you're doing, God. Where's your Messiah? Who are you? Why are you doing this? I don't, God, are you real? And Jesus is saying, when you had all those questions, when, when you were hurting, when you were crying over what's happening in your life, I saw you. I saw you. That's why all of a sudden things change. He's talking to the guy that's supposed to be the Messiah and he was going like, I'm asking God, where's the Messiah? And he's saying, I am he, I saw you. You wanna know where he is? You're right, you're talking to him right now. I saw you when you were in turmoil. I saw you when you were struggling. 
And it's probably interesting that Nathaniel, as he's reading the scriptures, maybe that morning he had read Genesis 28. It's the story of Jacob who, who was fleeing from his brother Esau in that very first book of the Bible. And he's fleeing for his life because he's cheated Esau. And he, he is going, trying to get away, going to his uncle's house. And on the way, he stops. He finds a little place that looks like a, maybe a little place where he could rest that's a little bit protected. And there's a lot of rocks around. He uses one and makes it a pillow. And he has a dream. And in the dream, he sees angels on a giant ladder going up to heaven. You know, you've heard about Jacob's ladder. That's what this is, this dream. And so Genesis 28 tells about this and there's the dream, the ladder and, and the angels are coming up and down and then God speaks directly to Jacob in his dream and he knows now that it's more than a dream that God's speaking to him and he says, this land where you are, I give it to you and to your descendants and all the families of the world are gonna be blessed through your descendants. And I imagine as Nathaniel's reading that, he's going, but Rome has overcome us. God, you said this is our land, but it's Rome's land. I mean, we're slaves to them, really. I mean, they, they, they own everything. They've taken everything. They've taken everything from us. We're just captives. What are you doing? I don't understand what you're doing. Lord, show me your Messiah. I don't understand. You promised this land to us. Bring the Messiah today. Bring the Messiah and have him destroy Rome. That's my plan. That's what I want you to do. That makes total sense to me. That was Nathaniel's plan, but it wasn't God's plan. Jesus says, Nathaniel, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, you believe? And then he goes right into what he had been reading. He said, you'll see greater things than these. Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. That was one of Jesus' names for himself. He loved that name. See, I would have thought he would always want to call me son of God, right? That's not what he said. He'd always say, I am the son of man. He was proud to bear our burdens. He was proud to come and die for us. And what he's saying is, I'm the ladder. You want to get to God? You want to know God? I'm the ladder. That's how you get there. I want you to see this last thing, number four. The greatest miracle, better than physical healing, better than some kind of financial reversal. The greatest miracle is to be known and seen by God. Nathaniel said, you know me. How do you know me? And Jesus says, I see you. Right there where you are. He sees you. He sees you. It, 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 it's not an accident that you've tuned in. He sees you. God wants you to know that. He knows you. Are you afraid right now? It's understandable. I mean, I don't feel like anything like this has happened in my lifetime, you know? It might have, should have with some of the H1N1 and things like that, but we didn't have the 24 seven like news going crazy, I guess, all the time. I don't know what it is, but you know, it, it's an unprecedented time. Maybe the economy has got you down right now. I can see, I could see that. And you're going, God, I don't understand what you're doing. I, I can't figure out what's going on. I, I, I wouldn't do it this way. I, I, I have a different agenda. I thought it was gonna be, and God's going like, I know you did. But here's the thing. You don't have any idea what I'm doing, but I know what I'm doing. You can't understand what's happening, but I know I'm God. You just have a decision to make. Will you trust my heart? Will you know that I see you? Maybe in the midst of that divorce or in the midst of uh, just some of the 
terrible health issues that you're having. You feel alone. You feel like nobody saw my tears when I was crying at two o'clock in the morning last night. And I'm just telling you, he saw it. That's what he was telling Nathaniel. I see you. I see you. I want you to realize what a miracle that is. That the God of the universe sees you. That the God of the universe knows you through and through. And he wants relationship with you. He wants to walk with you. He wants to be with you. You know, I don't know what these next few days, weeks, hope not months. I don't, I, I don't know where we're going. I can't see it. But I know who does and I know who's already there. In fact, he's already in tomorrow. He's waiting to welcome you into tomorrow. He lives outside of time. And he's saying, my little son, my little daughter, I've got you. I see you. I know you. I'm here. I'm God. I want us just for a few minutes on this crazy weekend. Just close your eyes with me. I want you to feel it. I want you to know it. I want you to realize God is right there with you. Right where you sit. Still laying in bed. He sees you. He knows. He's right there. Whatever the future holds, he's going to walk with us. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. And what you get to do, you get to tell your friends, come and see. I want you to meet this one who's changed everything for me. Some of you want to step into that maybe for the very first time. You can do that right now. Come and see. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you haven't forgotten us. Some of us, we felt like you're a million miles away, but you're not. I know Nathaniel thought that you didn't understand, that you didn't care, that you weren't interested, that they were being crushed under the heel of Rome, and yet all of it you cared about completely. You brought your son at exactly that time so that all of that world that was united under a brutal dictatorship, the gospel could spread, the good news about him could spread around the globe so quickly because of those Roman roads. God, you knew and you saw. Nathaniel learned that lesson, help us to know. I don't know what you're doing with this coronavirus. I pray protection over our people, over our nation, over our world. I, I pray that you would deliver those that are so vulnerable, the older folks and those with uh, chronic heart or lung conditions, God. More than anything else though, I know that you know. Some of us are really scared right now about our businesses, about our jobs, but I know that you've got us. We trust your heart. We'll walk with you. We'll believe. Work a miracle, God. Let us see that there is a miracle already happening, that you're right here, and that's a miracle. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you, community of faith. I thank you for joining us in this live online experience. And I just want you to know that we're here, we're praying. Please fill out that prayer request, that digital uh, thing that we've got there for you to fill out. Let us know what we can pray for. We wanna pray for you as a staff. We believe in that. We wanna walk with you. Might have to be six feet away right now, but I'll tell you, God's not six feet away. He's right there and he loves you with all that he is and he knows you. We'll see you next weekend, same place, live, online. We love you. We're here for you. Keep your chin up. 
Stay healthy. See you next week.